Consequence Podcast Network. It almost seems hard to believe, but is lineup season upon us? The slow, slow, ever so slow trickle of lineups starting to come out. We dive into them and it would surprise people, but we read books, mostly with pictures. Author Mark Myers with us today. The What Podcast, which bands this year that matter, Brad Steiner, Lord Taco, and Barry Corder, a fabulous author in his own right. This week's episode starts right now. What podcast, which bands, this year that matter, Russ Jackson, Mr. Lord, God Almighty Taco, and Barry Corder, I'm Brad Steiner, nice to see you. Uh, Lord Taco, have you seen the, the piece of property yet that you're actually Lord of yet? Have you have you been by Shogun Manor yet? Not yet, I got a new name though, I'm Frank Barcelona, nice to meet okay. you. <laughs> well, don't give up the bit. Uh, coming up today, we're talking to uh, Mark Myers from uh, it wrote an incredible book, Rock Concert, which Barry turned me on to. It's a book basically chronic, uh, chronolo- you tell me, is it a chronicle? Do you guys call this a chronicalization? Is that a word? What do you writers uh, call this? Yeah, it's a chronology. Chronology. Of the history of uh, live concerts from what do you say, 1950s to yeah. basically Live Aid, which is yeah. a fascinating place to end it. Yeah, we'll go through that with him uh, here in the the coming minutes. But I uh, wanted to circle w- around with you guys because I can't believe I'm saying this, but we might be on the precipice of lineup season. <laughs> I can't believe it, but the slow trickle of lineups have hap- has started, and uh, I woke up today. There are three music festival lineups that dropped all today. I'm just looking for them. Which, are we, are we Okeechobee, looking- which, which are the three? Well, Okeechobee announced, and then you know Sweetwater 420 Fest. I, is it still called Sweetwater 420 Fest, or is it just 420 Fest these days? Uh, and then there is a uh, sort of like a baseball integrated uh, music festival that announced today but i wanted to focus on okeechobee because i found this to be very interesting i don't think that taco you've never been to okeechobee have you nope it would be perfect for you because you can take the bus down but it's it's a, a different type of festival because you get to camp amongst the festival and when i mean that what i mean by that is there is a um i can't remember what they call the actual place where you perform but there's only two stages inside like this this wooded area it's a circle, right? It's a circle of, of woods. And you go into the, the, the woods, and that's where the two main stages are. Outside of the circle of trees, that's where all the camping is, but it's also where the side stages are. So the stages are sort of like intermixed with the campsites. And it's sort of what I think Bonnaroo tried to do with the plazas. If you look at half of the festival lineup from Okeechobee, half on the poster and all the way down, those are the people that you're going to find in and amongst the campsites. It's really interesting and well done. Um, they didn't do it last year. But the other thing I noticed about this lineup is that it has completely turned into a this is a dance EDM festival or at least a DJ driven festival, which when I went the one year, that was not at all uh, what I remember. I mean, I I saw Usher there for crying out loud. You know, I saw the Lumineers there. I saw um it was not at all this this collection of artists, which, you know, to me, there are 45 artists there that I, you could just I don't I've never heard in my life. Am I looking at this? I'm looking at the 21 or it's 22. Yeah, you got Tame Impala as the headliner. Yeah, it's 21. Yeah, yeah. Porter Robinson, Megan the Stallion, Grizz, Jungle, Gary Clark Jr. Yeah, you're see, you're reading the names that you know. 
Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> right. No. Okay. So Porter Robinson, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Denzel Curry, Ash Nico, Flying uh-huh. Lotus, I know a little bit. Yeah. And, and beyond that, mm, no. Right. right. It is, it is a, it's, really changed in the last couple of years. So in honor of the Okeechobee lineup uh, releasing today and being full of a whole bunch of DJs that, you know, might as well be DJ Lord Taco. I'm ready to play. If you guys are ready to play another round of um, r- r- real band or fake band. I don't have a name. For this. I, don't have a, I don't have a name for this game, but I've got a list of real bands that are right open. Get your face off of the lineup right now, Barry Porter. Stop looking at the lineup. I All want right. you. I've got real bands playing at Okeechobee and fake bands playing at Okeechobee. You guys tell me which is real and which is not, okay? All right. Okay. I did so well last time. I can't wait. Okay, Chobi or no coach? I don't know. I can't figure out the name. All right. So uh, this is a go. Here we go. Okeechobee, March 3rd through 6th. You tell me if it's a real band or a fake band. Hint of Lavender. Hint of Lavender. Is it appearing at Okeechobee or not appearing at Okeechobee? No. That's a that's a tea your wife sells in her tea shop. It might be. It is also a tea, but it's also a band that's playing at Okeechobee. You're both Oh, oh it's real. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, good start. Oh, man. Okay. Number two. Skin Clump. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was real, but I don't think it is. Yeah. If it's not, it should be. Uh, that is a fake band made up by Brad Steiner. Uh, one for both of you on the board. We did Actually, just, just Clomp is good. Yeah, it's good too. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, Player Dave. I'm going to say yes. Yeah, I'll go with, I hope he's real. Player okay. Dave. Both of you, two in a row. All right, number mm-hmm. four, Synergy. No. Man, that sounds like a bad 80s band. A real Okeechobee artist or fake Okeechobee artist? Synergy. Uh, I'm going to say yes. Uh, what did Taco say? Did you say no. I said, I said fake. Barry Quarter on the lead is a real band. <laughs> oh, appearing at Okeechobee. a band called Synergy? There is. Yeah, what, about this? what about this band? Itchy. Yes. Yes. Itchy. Still in lead. Barry Quarter, not a real band. Not a real <laughs> band. Itchy. One final one. Let's see if uh, we'll make this for two I'm pretty points. sure I've seen Itchy before. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> what was her name? Uh, final one. Tell me if this is a real band playing at Okeechobee or not. Donut Muscles. <laughs> Donut Muscles? <laughs> uh, they they opened for Skinner, didn't they? <laughs> Maybe. <they. laughs> I'll say uh, yes. I'm going to say no. Well, Barry Quarter, big winner today. I don't think that Lord Taco is won this game. Every ever. time. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you see donut muscles opening yeah. for Skinner on the beach down in Jacksonville? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so Okeechobee uh, came out today. There's also uh, 420 Fest. Now, Barry, have you ever been to 420 Fest? The one that's originally was created by Sweetwater Brewing, if I'm not mistaken. They do it just outside Atlanta. I have not, but like I told you, the idea of going to Atlanta for anything is um, probably not going to happen. Well, if you run through the lineup of 420 Fest for 2022, um, just run through and, and check it out. It's going to be exactly like the lineup in 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017, 2016. It is the same festival every year. You know, I know that the string cheese incident people and the widespread panic people and the fish guys, they all love this stuff so much. But my God, how can you just keep hearing the same things over and over and over? This is the wow, same festival is. every year. OK, so I would want to see Oysterhead, uh, Trey, not so much, String Cheese and Umphreys. That's pretty much the same band. Wait, you want to see Oysterhead, but not Trey? Trey's yeah. in Oysterhead. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, I know. What about ba- Barry? Do you want to see Eggplant Revenge? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, look. Did you see who there, who's there, Taco? Turquoise Mm-mm. with Jerry Harrison. We have another of course. chance. Of course. Yeah. Man, I'm so mad I didn't see. I'm uh, Okay, I'm going to have to rethink. I might have to go down there. You might have to go to Atlanta. I wish you would. Because Goose the only person... Is- yeah, Goose, JJ Gray, I like. 
This, oh, I like this. I like he this is, lineup. JJ Gray is by far. Is there an artist that grates your nerves more than anything else? JJ Gray is that guy. I can't oh, I do it as much as you. Then. I can't. I've seen him once. No, I've only seen him once. He's got this okay. big giant belt buckle. And I swear to God, my hand to God, I walked up to that show with Brian Stone, who is the king of Southern rock. This guy yeah, just he loves that he, stuff. It's all he listens to. I swear to everything. Holy Barry and Russ. I walked up to the stage and this is what came out of his mouth. Hell far. Hell, hell far. Hell far. <laughs> hell, hell far. Who, Brad or JJ? JJ Gray. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, his name's Brian Barry. His name's Brian. Uh, Brian it, sorry. It, it's insufferable that guy is absolutely unlistenable for me okay but enjoy it i mean that's that's what 420 fest is man that's what 420 fest is well depending on how they broke this up yeah depending on how they broke this up there's some stuff i'd like to see i really want to see that turquoise yeah Yeah, i want to see that show that's killing me all Um, right who's this uh who's this uh snop doog who's that i know right doog is he there again i uh Yes. No, no, no. You might be looking at last year's lineup. Is he there again? Uh, it says he 2020. This says 2022. Oh, my God. Yeah. L- look, this is hard stuff. This is a very hard thing to do. So I don't mean to dog on them, but um, my God, this is just the same festival every single year. I know. But man, if he brings Martha and does some cooking demonstrations. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait a second. You're telling me you wouldn't go for that. I could. I could have done the same game with the with the Sweetwater 420 Fest. Did you see who's playing this year? Sex Brews. Sex Brews. <laughs> I was so excited to see Sex Brews. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it's not just Sex Brews. It's Sex Brews with a question mark. Yeah, they're yeah, right in front of certainly so. <laughs> Oh God! I poor. <laughs> who, who named certainly so? I'm sh- I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is a great festival. I'm sure it is wonderfully done. But man, oh man, it feels like this is the same. I mean, like for instance, uh, just to prove my point, I don't mean belabor this, but let me go. You go back to 2017. All right. Widespread panic. Trey Anastasio. Ween. Slightly stupid. Mo. Lettuce. Anders Oz, that's the same thing in 2018. Pretty good, too. 2018, (laughs) String Cheese Incident, Humphreys McGee, Tedeschi Truck, Sturgill Simpson, Joe Russo, Green Sky Bluegrass. (sighs) That that was not a bad lineup. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying it's the same lineup every year. It must work for them. I want to know know who named Certainly So. Yeah. Just Widespread sound. Panic, Avid Brothers, Jason Isbell, Joe Russo, Revolution, Moon Taxley, Claypool, Lennon, Delirium, J.J. Gray. Man, oh, man. I mean, God love you. If you go to this, I'm glad you have a, I'm glad you have a fun time. I hope you have a blast, Barry. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll tell see. me. So tell me about the guest uh, this week. Tell me uh, all I need to know about Mark. Uh, Mark is an author, a journalist for the wall street journal. He's written a, a book. Uh, he went back and, uh, dug up the history of, uh, co- of concerts, basically, uh, the chronology of, uh, live music concerts from the fifties to live aid, which like, uh, I, I think I said, uh, well, it's a, a, that it didn't make sense at first, but when he explained it, stopping there makes perfect sense. That sort of was the end of that era and the beginning of what we now know is, uh, you know, concerts, sure. live music. So, yeah, it was, it was fascinating. I love talking to him. I hope we'll probably talk to him again. I hope so. Yeah. It's a good resource. Um, come back. Uh, let's talk to him and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little ACL Fest next on the What Podcast. Which bands this year that matter? Mark, how are you? Nice to meet you. Same here. So, uh, what part of what part of the country are you in? Where are you in right New now? New York. Okay. If there's anything that would stun uh, the people that listen to this podcast, is that we read books. Um, <laughs> Period. Yeah, which is uh, which is shocking. We don't read Barry's articles, but we read books. Um, it's very weird. Barry writes for a living, and I think I've read more of your work than Barry's, and I've known that guy for ten years. As as you know, Brad. 
our reach is vast. Oh and, my God, uh, it's unbelievable. It's so and uh, Michaela, who is your, uh, I guess, your press agent, Mark? Publicist, yeah. She hooked us up with uh, Krungbin, I believe. I think it was. Um, I hope I'm right in saying that. It was either that or Sylvanesso. Uh, either way, it was very cool. And she said, would you like to talk to Mark? And when I saw the title of your book and uh, the, the theme of the book, I thought this is kind of what we do. So <laughs> right over the plate, right over. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a lob. So I was like, I'd love to talk to Mark. And so I reached out to Brad and Russ and, and I uh, said, this, this is exactly what we do. And especially given what we've just been through and the, you know, the whole history of, I don't know if, Mark, if you know, what we do is a podcast that started about Bonnaroo. So it started about that live festival, but it has expanded into festivals in general. It's uh, great. So, it, so it's a natural fit, right, for, sure for what this book is about. So, Well, well Mark, Mark, how did you get your start? Were you much like Barry in, in an entertainment writer or a music writer? How did it all start for you? Uh, it started for me quite differently. Um, I, I sort of came up through business writing, um, tax writing, believe it or not. Um, what a, lot a fascinating of real estate topic. Writing. <laughs> fascinating. Um, always, oh, <laughs> always, that book? Dream, always dreamed of the rock lifestyle. And then in 2010, um, I started writing for the Wall Street Journal and uh, wound up writing on, whoa, wait for it, uh, rock. And um uh, you know, it was a, it was it took it it took decades, but the dream was realized. <laughs> and so it's so weird. I started in rock music, and now I want to write a book about accounting. It's so yeah. strange. I uh, <laughs> trying to go the opposite direction. You know, it's amazing how things happen. <laughs> uh, so, but 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 is it was it just because you were a fan? Did you play? No, I, I, you know, I did play piano. I'm a very big jazz fan, have been for years. Um, in fact, write a jazz blog called jazzwax.com. Uh, it's a daily. It's been, uh, it's been going on since 2007, six days a week. Um, but for me, um, wow. it just wasn't a reasonable way to earn a living. Uh, there were other ways to do that. Um, I started at the New York Times, uh, left there, went into magazines, and then went into newsletters, and then finally – um, was sort of writing on jazz. And a friend says, you've got to speak to my editor at the Wall Street Journal. And I did. And I've been there ever since I, as a contributor. Well, I mean, first off, I think that's incredible that uh, you started something so long ago and it's still going. How's, uh, how's Jazz Wax doing these days? It's great. It keeps, yeah. it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Well, as a, uh, as a guy, the reason I ask is because, you know, you get lost in this sort of uh, world. I live in New Orleans, so jazz music is everywhere in this town. And right. people talk about it constantly, especially with, you know, radio. What is that constant bleeping that I keep hearing? Is that what is that? Is that just me? No, I hear it. That's a copy of my book, Rock Concert, okay. that keeps running <laughs> my eyes, which we're going to talk about. Yeah, we are. It's either that or sales. It's sales of the book. So, so yeah, that's <laughs> God, that another book one, sold. Barry. That was a good one, Barry. <laughs> so, the reason I say that is because in this city, it's easy to immerse yourself in. It's easy to immerse yourself in constant jazz, but if you don't necessarily know much about it, it's not on the forefront of a conversation, is, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's absolutely true. Uh, but for me, you know, rock, we're all the same generation. I mean, rock has just always been there for me. And I've always been curious, more and more curious about it, but backstage and getting to do interviews. And uh, mm -hmm. I started uh, a column at the Wall Street Journal called Anatomy of a Song, which took off, um, which was just a single drill down on one song where the uh, writer uh, and musicians were interviewed. Uh, I interviewed them and uh, created a narrative from it. Uh, but it's incredibly popular and hmm. rock concert. I've always wondered about the history of the rock concert, not so much the sex, drugs and rock and roll stuff, but the just the business of it. How did this thing come about? How did it evolve from R&B in the early 1950s? And how did it become this eight, nine billion dollar business? Um, and me, it was fascinating me, to track that. Yeah, let me jump in there because uh, and Brad, you were. You might have been heading that way, but I, I want to go ahead and put that point on it. This is why we started our podcast was because we were fascinated by the infrastructure of Bonnaroo as much as the what was on stage. 
That's interesting. The fact that they could turn literally a 700 acre farm into the fifth largest city in Tennessee for six days fascinated us. And so that's, that's why I wanted to talk to you. Cause we've gone from, I just watched the Led Zeppelin. Um, or no, it wasn't Led Zeppelin. I've seen so many documentaries in the last two weeks. Grateful the, Dead. Idea, the, the, well, the Peter Grant interview where it went, it, it switched from the artist back in the day, late sixties was getting 20 to 25% of the cut and the promoter was getting the rest. And Peter Grant with Led Zeppelin said, uh uh-uh, uh, we're gonna flip that. Just blew my mind because I I remember the opinion of Peter Grant back in the day, and people just thought he was the worst. But he really changed everything. And I know that's a complete sidebar. We'll get into that in a minute. But it's that evolution that also fascinated me, and that's why I wanted to talk to you. So um, here we are. And, and Brad often tells the story. That's how this podcast got started is we were walking down the road and saw miles and miles and miles of cable and thought somebody had to put that there, you know? Mm-hmm. So maybe that's the same thing. Sorry to step on you there, Brad, but no, it's okay. No, it's, it's, it's exactly where I was going. When you talk about the business of uh, live shows and live music, you know, you start with the, the origin of R and B, to today, it seems like it was uh, a artist first enterprise there for a while. Now it feels as though it is all controlled by the promoter and the two large companies um, with with every everybody else sort of sitting around waiting for them to make a decision. Would you say that's fair? I think the business has grown exponentially and and to the extent uh, that it is a very valuable business. Uh, Business only becomes a valuable business when there is consolidation and somebody's got a vision and they're able to figure out how to make money from it. You have to keep in mind the rock business, air quotes, um, wasn't a business until the very late 60s and it wasn't Woodstock. It really was a lot of these small uh, ex um, warehouses and uh, former churches that were converted into hard rock um, clubs, so to speak, but no alcohol. They, they didn't serve alcohol at a lot of these places uh, because obviously they wanted the teen market and wouldn't, been, wouldn't have been able to bring them in. Uh, but that's when the business starts to turn. That's when a guy named Frank Barcelona figures out that the club shouldn't be dictating the terms to the artists in terms of whether they can play at his club and anybody else's club in town. Um, Frank Barcelona um, flips that flips that so that basically the bands coming over from England, Cream, uh, Led Zeppelin, are basically saying to the clubs, unless... You, you have to show us how you're going to turn us into a big deal in this city. Um, you have to prove to us that you've got marketing smarts and you've got to prove to us that you've got promotional ability. If you can do that, we'll play at your club. And if you can't do that, we're not going to be playing at your club. We're going to be playing at your rival's club. So it, it changed the dynamic um, of I, the I, industry, really, I, I, the, um, from the, the promoter first, standpoint. Sure. But the first question I comes to mind, who was the best at that at the time? That would be Frank Barcelona. Yeah. But, yeah. but was there an artist specifically that that would fit in that glove a lot easier than others? No. Yeah. With the rise of FM radio in the very late 1960s um, and the so-called second or third British invasion, where you've got album album rock coming in, um, where those albums are getting played on FM and audiences in the States want to hear them in concert. You've got a lot of British bands who are coming over. And, and initially, a lot of the, the owners or the managers of these, these new ballrooms, these new, uh, <laughs> what Steve Miller calls psychedelic dungeons, because they're all painted with psychedelic colors and everyone's sort of cashing in on that. But you, you've got a lot of these bands that are coming over and they are suddenly put into these clubs where the promoter is demand the the promoter's demands must be met um and and it really has a much more to do with the rise of fm radio and the rise of album rock um that's why that's why the tables are turned that's why um promoters um are that's why bands and pros are able to dictate to clubs what the standards are going to be the new standards are going to be i, I never really thought about it that way uh Armin. it makes sense because prior to that it was very singles based wasn't it 
I mean, yeah. you would you would put together a concert with eight, six to eight acts that might have at most three hits, right, or three songs, or That's one right. hit that they would play twice or three times. And now where you got uh, album rock, you've got uh, fans that want to hear an entire album, like a Led Zeppelin or or whoever can do the bigger shows, and and uh, so the Man. and the promoters kind of realized there was a lot of money to be made. And, and, and they didn't have to go through um, a single promoter who owned, you know, a city or a large part of the country. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting anecdote in my book, you know, rock concert that uh, is kind of interesting. Um, when this guy, Frank Barcelona, goes to a club in Boston, <clears throat> I think it was called the Psychedelic Supermarket or something like that. Um, and he says to the guy, hey you know, I'm going to bring in all these British, British acts, all these British bands. Um, what can you, what can you do for them in terms of marketing? And the guy goes, I don't even want to hear anything more about it. And the guy goes, well, you know, what, 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 what what's the problem? He goes, I know you're going to bring in Jerry and the pacemakers and Freddie and the dreamers. And I'm not interested in that stuff. I, I don't want to hear it. And Barcelona keeps trying to cut in and say, no, no, this isn't those guys. And he goes, I, you know, I'm not interested. I'm just not interested. So Barcelona then, you know, goes to see Don Law in Boston, who, you know, is is the major, major promoter in New England, always has been and still is today, um, and gave Frank Bar- and gave uh, Don Law the business because Don Law was open to hearing about all these British bands coming in that were hard rock. It wasn't wasn't all this pop stuff of areas you were talking about, the AM radio stuff. It was the right. FM radio guys that he was bringing in. And um, that's, you know, that, that changes things considerably because the the, the hard rock guys can play for two, three hours. The singles guys could play for like 20 minutes and suddenly they were out of songs. Mm-hmm. Are, right. we, are we talking about, like, give me an artist uh, just for frame of reference, like Dire Straits. Would that be one? Well, they're later. I mean, if we're talking about 69, 70, we're, you know, we're talking about Led Zeppelin. Zeppelin We're talking about Jethro Tull. You know, you're talking about progressive rock and hard rock as it's emerging. Um, So, you know, it's it's those kinds of bands that are being brought in. Sure. Uh, And yeah. The interesting thing that Barry, you said it is single based and then it became album rock based. Fast forward to today, where if you put out a, you put out an album, you are on an island by yourself. Nobody's putting out albums anymore. This it's, is a, an album today is a lost leader. Right. All the money. This is why the pandemic was such so catastrophic to the business um, and why, you know, so many of these artists are freaking out. And so many of these companies, uh, Live Nation, are the, uh, they're all freaking out because they don't know what the next business model is. Is it streaming or is it live? But the the when you when you when you when you go out today, your money is made on the road. Your money is not made on an album. Your album, basically, when your album comes out, your your record company carves it up. They slice it up like a loaf of bread, and it all goes up on YouTube for free. How do you make money if your mu- if your music instantly is free? Well, you make it by touring. But if you can't tour, um, you better hope a shoe store is hiring because there's nothing really as a musician. There's nothing more that these poor guys can do if they can't tour. You can, you know, recording isn't going to make them much money. Mm-hmm. The, the the book is a rock concert. You went through uh, a bunch of different things. I want read one little excerpt where um, Bob Eubanks was trying to book a show. Uh, now, if you don't know who Bob Eubanks is, uh, let me feel pretty old here. He was a game show host, but also before that, he was a Very radio good. guy. He was a radio guy. He was uh, and as a fellow radio guy. I just this would never happen today. <laughs> There's just no chance that this would possibly. Uh, how in the world did that come about? How did Bob Eubanks get into ra- uh, record? I'm sorry, show promotion. Well, he had a club. He had a little club in L.A. Um, that, you know, he they sort of book book bands in there. He's a partner in this little club, and he wanted to get move more into promotion, more into booking bands. You know, he was sort of excited by that, animated by it. Um, and, he, you know, the station that he was on, I can't remember the name, you probably do, but it was all the leading DJs in LA at the time. It was just a, a murderer's row of, of DJs. So he was looking for another outlet for himself. And um, he wanted to book this, this band called the Beatles uh, into the Hollywood Bowl. 
and they, you know, uh, their manager would only, you know, it was twenty five thousand bucks. That's what that's what he had to pay to, to, you know, to get to get the Beatles. And he found a way. I mean, keep in mind, Sinatra was getting ten thousand. Ella Fitzgerald was getting ten thousand at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, um, Brian Epstein wanted twenty five grand. And Bob Eubanks found a way to mortgage his house and come up with the money and then went to the Hollywood Bowl and said, if I can get the Beatles, would you, will you let me book them? And they said, yeah. And then he, he sort of worked two sides until he finally got them. Yeah. Um, and he booked he booked he was the one who booked them into the Hollywood Bowl th- for, for all three concerts out there. Hey, hey, Barry, just letting you know, this radio guy ain't that smart. <laughs> um, I'm not going to be able to figure that out. I promise you. You know, it's so funny. I, it. I, it <laughs> Totally random, but I'm just sitting here thinking in, in our city, uh, Mark, we have a, a park called Warner Park, which was built because several of the business leaders wanted to build, bring Billy Graham to town. So they took out loans, just like you're talking about mortgage houses, and they built right. this park. Um, so I'm I trying had to no remember. idea about that, actually. Yeah. Warner Park was built to bring Billy Graham to town. For, for rock listeners, it's, it, it's Billy Graham. The televangelist, not Bill yeah. Graham, the yeah, rock yeah, promoter yeah. from San Francisco. Yeah. Not, not the, not the, yeah. Just to distinguish. Uh, but I'm just, when you were saying that, I was like, yeah, that's what people did. And I, I was trying to think back in the late 60s and 70s. I was little, uh, but I remember the Zeppelin and I remember the Who and I remember all that coming in the, the advent of big festival uh, or big arena rock or big stadium, I should say. Um, somebody saw there was a chance like Bob Eubanks to make money. How much right? did that cost Bob Eubanks, by the way? He had to put, come up with 25 grand. Yeah. 25 grand. grand. Yeah. 25 yeah. grand, 25,000 bucks. I mean, do the math. That's probably a couple of hundred thousand dollars back then. No kidding. Um, sizable amount of money, but mortgaging his house, the banks wouldn't get it. He, he went into the traditional banks and they would say, well, why do you want to mortgage your house? And he goes, well, I want to book this band called the Beatles. And they said, have a nice day. Yeah. You know, yeah, they just weren't going to loan them the dough. Yeah. That's I've what I've never I'm, heard of them. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to imagine all of that. You know, the, uh, my, I have two older brothers that are musicians and my dad would, would always say, you know, they would come to him and say, I, we just need one more bank loan. We just need one more piece of equipment and we're going to hit it big. Mm-hmm. I can only imagine, you know, Bob Eubanks going to a, a bank for well, 25 would, grand. I'll stop you right there. Just think about saying to yourself, I can make money off of a show in 2021. Nobody's, I mean, how many people are really making that many, that much money off of shows, just one off shows? I mean, even well, if, it's impossible it, to do it on your own today anyway because right. of, the, of the consolidation. You know, right. you got Live Nation. There's like five companies that book all these shows. You can't even get near a decent venue exactly um, to make Ex- money because these, you know, they're all monopolized. It's not monopoly, but they're dominated, right. better word. Do, they're dominated by a, small it's like trying to come up with a new way of it's like you have a great idea for a new computer you know good luck so you'll make three of them or four of them your friends will all have them but you're not going to sell it like apple in terms of distribution and everything else that these guys can um can come up with i'm glad i'm glad that you you went there because that was my exact point of trying to bring up the bob eubank story is like there is no possible way that that even the small well there is a possible way but this is why the smaller venues are dying and and falling apart because they can't even sustain the model anymore uh they're getting gobbled up i mean the amount of hatred you walk into any venue in this city the amount of hatred you will hear about you know live nation or aeg you'll hear it within seconds seconds Hmm. Because they dominate so, so right. uh, powerfully. Yeah, you know. putting them out well, That's business. what I did. I mean, in the book, that's what I did. I mean, I spoke with more than 90 people who had basically front row seats to the entire rise of the industry from 19... It, the book spans from 1950 to 1985 to Live Aid. Mm-hmm. So it's from the very beginning of the so-called rock concert model all the way through. And I've, you know, I interview rock stars. I interview promoters, managers, um, roadies. I mean, anyone who is connected with the rise of this form, the rock concert, um, it's in, and it's in their voice. You get to hear what they sound like talking about this. And it's fascinating, isn't it, to sort of see how one thing leads to another and all these people who are sort of trying to figure out what to do suddenly start figuring it out and they start right. to build it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
can we come uh, let's come back to that because i think that's probably where we want to go but i want to just well this seems like a good point uh now that we've talked for a little while did you approach it as a rock and roll fan or as a tax reporter or just a simple reporter or <laughs> no, as a fan. I mean, was it more business you know what no. i mean no 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 as a fan okay. I, I write on rock for the i write on rock for the wall street journal so i'm not writing on the business of music uh, those are those reporters are in la i write on the music itself but, um and, but and you know what i mean there is a different way to a, a yeah, approach it. i mean yeah. this is this is from a fan's this is this is a fan's book if you are the if you, if 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 the rock, if your first rock concert was your rite of passage as a teenager, then this is your book. It's not a business book. Um, it's just the rise of this thing called the rock concert, which happens to be a business. But it's all, you know, everybody who's quoted, there are no business people quoted in this book. I mean, the only business people are the entrepreneurs who put on the rock concerts. Um, after that, it's Alice Cooper. You know, it's Bob Weir. It's, it's, it's Roger Waters. I mean, it's rock stars and the people that turned this crazy, weird thing into something that kept getting bigger and bigger because you and me all went to these concerts and we found that this was an amazing thing as a kid to go to something like this where all you saw around you were other kids just like you and there were no parents there and you were on your own. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing, it was a liberating at least it was for me. I mean, my, I'm a, maybe a little older. My first concert was in 1933. No, I'm just kidding. My first rock concert was in 1974. Yeah. Uh, so we'd have been close. We'd have been, but, and, but that's why I ask is uh, there is, there are a lot of different ways to look at it. And, and maybe I'm 58. So I'm, I'm probably older than you. Yep. Um, no, not quite. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, music in, in Bonnaroo, and this is why I wanted to talk to you and why we do this. It has that magic, you know, pixie dust unicorn element to it that we all know and love. And then it has the business side and somehow Brad and Russ and I try to merge the two. Um, I don't know if we do it well enough or not, but the more I think about it, you know, you can, you can get too far into the weeds and it loses that magic. And I don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I want to eventually get into the, you know, where it may be going and all that, but it, it is interesting to see the evolution of it all. Um, cause it, I mean, the best way I think can think of to describe it is it's, you know, it's the wizard of Oz. Nobody wants to look behind the curtain. You know, we all have our, we all have our rock and roll legends and all these documentaries and all that come out. Sometimes I don't want to see them. You know what I mean? I, oh, you don't, I don't want to go in the kitchen to see how your food is made. You just want to eat your see steak. The sausage I get made. it. Yeah, whatever you want to. <laughs> Not have pretty it. what goes on in the kitchen. It's um, exactly right. But at the same time, it's it's interesting how something small becomes something big. Right. And it it and that happens not because companies get involved, but because an entire youth culture, an entire generation decides that they are. You know, keep in mind before 1950. Before 1955, there's no music for kids. The music industry never bothered creating any music for teens. It, the music was for adults. There were children's records, right? And then there was music for adults. And kids, like in the 1940s and before, they pretty much had to listen to their parents' records, whether that was Glenn Miller or, you know, Doris Day or whatever it was. They had to find, you know, and back then, I mean, kids... Kids wore their parents' clothes. Kids were in a rush to look old. They, they dressed old. You couldn't really do anything until you were 21 as a kid. There was nothing, nothing for the teen market, zero. And rock and roll is the first form of music that is literally designed for and marketed to teenagers. And finally, a youth culture has market power. Kids can now control what they want, what they're going to buy, what they don't like, who they want to see in concert, and who their heroes are. And that had been unheard of before the rise of rock and roll. I don't know, Mark. I, I know a lot of kids that love Perry Cuomo. Uh, they are big, big fans of <laughs> That's Perry. true. Hey, so you I forgot talk, about that. You talked to you. He talk just to, said Cuomo, by the way. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> what, how do you, Perry Cuomo. I don't know. Who, Cuomo. 
whatever. Um, so the uh, you, you talk to you talk to artists, you talk to fans. Is there a moment when we talk to Bonnaroo fans, they all say the one show that changed it all for them and their favorite Bonnaroo show is always it will always forever be Paul McCartney. Um, nine times out of ten, it will be McCartney. Be. Bonnaroo was was the was the uh, the show of all shows. It was there one that you kept hearing about over and over and over with all your conversations in this book. No, there were the big concerts, you know, the Who's concerts uh, in the 70s, Pink Floyd's concerts. You know, they were theatrical. They were visual. I mean, before MTV, you know, you get the wall, you know, Pink Floyd, where everything is so cinematic and visual while you're listening to the music. It added that extra dimension. But what's really funny to me is, you know, when you ask about this so-called question, you, you know, you can ask people like, do you know where your car keys are right now? And they'd go, I'm not sure. And they'd say, your sister-in-law's birthday. Do you know your sister-in-law's birthday? And they were I think it's in May or something. And you ask them a series of questions like that. And then I would say, what was your first rock concert? And it was like, oh, my first rock concert. Well, I went with my two friends and we went down in the green Chevy. And when we got there, we went in. And I remember we were sitting in A6, 7, and 8. I mean, they know every detail about their first. Everybody knows their first rock concert inside and out. And it's kind of interesting, you know, to Barry's point about it being this, this seminal moment, this rite of passage, that, that it became this transition. <clears throat> I think I describe it in the book as almost like passing through the mirror, like Alice in Wonderland or passing into a different world. It's like you went, you went into your first concert, a kid, and you came out an, a, a young adult. I mean, you, you, you went in, a di- you, you came out a different person than the person who went in. You, you suddenly had responsibility for yourself and you were the one who made choices about things. And there were bad things that you could do and good things. And you kind of figured that out. Maybe you did a mix of them, but you were very different passing through that rock concert. You came out a, 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 a different, a different individual. I think you're right about that. Cause my I first think. one, cause my first one was Celine Dion and Michael Bolton, UTC arena. So I came out different guy after that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it's such a great point, Mark. My first ticket that I was allowed to buy was Leonard Skinner, and the plane go. crashed about three weeks ahead. Amazing. The first show I ever actually got to see Freebird. was Marty Robbins. Uh, but yeah, Skinner, you're you're right. Whether your parents took you and stayed in the building with you, and you were able to go off with your friends, or they dropped you off, was pretty much a huge moment, right? I think you got it exactly right. I mean, look at the Beatles at Shea, right? There's 55,000 kids. Most of them are girls, and they're screaming their lungs out. And and anybody who knows anything about New York City knows there are two ways to get to Shea Stadium. Mm -hmm. One is by subway, which most of those kids didn't take. So their parents had to have dropped them off. I remember writing this article on, on the Beatles at Shea for the Wall Street Journal, and I'm thinking to myself, well, if the parents drove them there, why would they bother? I mean, most parents would say, hey, I'm not taking you or I don't want to do that or your father's coming home late or we don't have an extra car. You know, they wouldn't have had 55,000 fans at that stadium if not for one reason, which is that parents did drive the kids there, but then they went next door to the World's Fair. The World's Fair was, you know, the 1964 Mm -hmm. Five World's Mm -hmm. Fair in New York, where you get the introduction of the Mustang. You know, it's one of the most spectacular World's Fairs in U.S. history. The parents all went, took their kids, dropped the kids off, and then went to eat Belgian waffles Mm -hmm. at the World's Fair right next door in Flushing. So it's kind of interesting, you know, that um, the and and this is what how I ended the article, which is kind of interesting too. The parents thought they saw the future at the World's Fair. Their kids actually did. <laughs> That's you know, great. That, I never knew that. That is actually, I didn't even realize that the World's Fair was happening at the same time. But the exact you know, just, same time. just as an aside, I'm a huge Mets fan. So the reason, I don't know if many people know this, but the reason why the guy who owned the Mets at the time built Shea Stadium where he built it was because of cars. He thought that everybody was going to be transporting via the automobile to to um, to stadiums. And then you get to 2022 and, you know, you have to have a you have to have a multiplex and condos and restaurants and bars and entire cityscape around the, the stadium now just for these things to survive. Um, 
neither here nor there. So in the in the book, though, you also keep talking about you, well, you don't keep talking. You get into best live albums, best concert films, best rock documentaries. The thing that uh, I found to be interesting is that you make the distinction between concert films and rock documentaries, which are very different. And the fact that in 2021, rock concert films now, especially post COVID, may be the most useless medium in all of music. It does nothing for anyone anymore. Yeah. I mean, what I did in the back of the book, because I figured while I was writing it, you know, I was going to hear incessantly, you never did the who it leads. You don't have the Allman Brothers at this place. This particular concert, I can't believe you forgot that. I can't, you know, it's like I, t- rather than hear that steady, steady drone of those, those quote complaints, um, I figured, let me, let me provide 50 of the 50 of my favorite concerts, 50 favorite, you know, rock films and 50 favorite documentaries. So that if you wanted to know more about the 1950s, there are five excellent documentaries. You want to know more about the dead. There's a great six parter that's streaming now. You you know, you want to know about, you know, which which rock concerts are most important through the years. Well, here's my 50. Um, It just gives it it just gives the reader an extra place to think about, you know, what, you can't fit everything in. If I, I literally had to cut this book down almost by a third, maybe almost a half. There's, you can't. I, I realized finally, and my editor realized, you just need to tell a story. It, you can't load. It can't be so jam packed that people have to buy a pickup truck to buy it. Right? You can, it's like here's your 15 volume set of rock concert, and at every concert you ever wanted to know about, it's in here. You have to just tell a great story. And, and that, that's what I was focused on. And those lists that you make, did you cut it off to 85 too? I think they're 50 each, right? Those okay, lists but, no, I mean, I mean for, to 1985, you cut to it off in 1985. Oh, I, I, cut it off, I cut it off with Live Aid because okay. the number of the people I interviewed, it was interesting. A number of the people I interviewed said, with the rise of Ticketmaster and tickets going to triple digits, you know, going from free and like $15, suddenly three three eighty five a seat, um, Live Aid was the last old school, co- old school mm-hmm. large concert put on by old school promoters. You know, the co-promoters in the States uh, was Bill Graham um, of San Francisco fame and uh, Larry Magid of Philadelphia, where the event was held. And it was old school. It was these guys had come up in the 1960s. They, you know, they had gone to Alan Freed's, you know, rock and roll shows at, at the um uh, at the Paramount, Brooklyn Paramount. So the, Live Aid kind of is the end of an era before things start to change. Doesn't mean rock concerts die. Doesn't mean that rock concerts weren't a still kind of affordable after. It's just that it was a transition moment, Live Aid, uh, where the old ended and the new began. Did it feel like there was a direct line? Were you able to draw a direct line or did it feel like- From it- the 1950s to 85? Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, that's what this book is about. You literally read through and see how one thing leads to another, why one event caused something else, why external factors cause something. Like, for instance, the wireless guitar. The wireless guitar liberates everybody on stage. I mean, prior Angus of ACDC would not exist if not for the wireless guitar. <laughs> you know, it, it used to be that the the the, the the pigtail cables, wires that ran from the guitar to the amps would tangle everybody up. You couldn't move around. You had to stay real still, especially in the dark. Um, these things would become frayed if you if you roamed too far and suddenly yanked on it. The, 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 somebody would have to rush on stage and repair it and tape it up. The wireless guitar liberates. Uh, so I'll give you another one that liberates. Arenas. When arena rock begins after the disaster at Altamont, where every locality in the country refuses to grant permits to outdoor concerts and rock has to go indoors into these new sports arenas. The problem arenas faced is that they were only selling about probably 60 percent of the house. And that's because the stage people... People could only the, the artists were facing one direction, so you couldn't sell seats behind the artist. Right, and then the speakers were sitting on the stage; they were mounted on the stage. They were all stacked up. You know, you could see, remember the Grateful Dead concerts with all these Marshall amps stacked all the way up to the seat, to, to the roof. So these these speakers would block seats. You couldn't sell seats. You couldn't charge you know twenty five dollars or twenty dollars and and 
charge somebody $20 in the front row and then charge somebody else $20 where they couldn't see the band half the time. It's not until riggers, not rigor mortis, but riggers, guys who can hoist speakers, guys who had worked on, you know, Disney on parade, all of these big arena kind of entertainment things, ice capades, not until they, not until these guys started to move into the rock business where bands suddenly realized these guys could hoist speaker systems up to the ceiling and liberate enormous amounts of revenue of worth of seating in arenas and then they could sell the seats that previously they couldn't sell. So it's little external things like this that grow the business. I hate to ask because this book is coming out in what, a month? November 9th. Are you, are you already thinking about part two? It's a what possibility. Happened? You know, it's, it's something, it's something, it's, it's obviously yeah. something to consider. We'll see how the first part of the first book does, but the, this book is people who have read it. They're telling me, I can't stop reading it. I'm on the edge of my seat all the time. You know, it, it's just, I can't wait to see what happens next because I'm writing it. I'm writing it. Like I would write anything dramatically. It, 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 every chapter leaves you hanging. You know, you start the next one. Oh, what's going to happen now? And, yeah, you well, know, how do the beach boys? Wow. This is how they got their start in these little concerts. Wow. And people are just, you know, what I'm hearing is that people are on the edge of their seat. They're reading it like it's, um, um, the born identity. I mean, it's just, it's just <laughs> you're constantly on the edge of your seat. Well, I'm asking because as you, I mean, it, 85 is a, is a great place to end. Uh, because in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking of all the changes that have happened since. Uh, I right. saw Carlos Santana last Tuesday, and I remember remarking to my my people that I was sitting with, I remember the days of general seating, which was pre the Who Cincinnati, you know, when you got there early and you sprinted to the front of the stage, and it was great. I miss those days because – Last Tuesday during Santana, if somebody got up and wanted to dance in the aisle, the dance police were immediately on top of you to make you go sit down, which I get. I'm not picking on the venue. I get it. There's insurance. There's all kinds of safety reasons. I, I, I'm not. But it it took away a lot of the rock and roll vibe to those pre 80, whatever that was, seven concerts. Yeah. You know, where, where you where anything could happen. And that was, a, you know, I hate part to say the excitement. I hate to sound, yeah, I hate to say this, but it was a different time. I know. You know, old. it was a gentler, people <laughs> kids gentler. get off my lawn. <laughs> you know, now you go to a concert and you want to strangle the, per the couple that gets up in front of you to dance, you yeah. know, because they can't go in the aisle. So, you know, this couple that are on their first date suddenly get up and start dancing to Hall and Oates. It's like you can't say anything. Yeah. So you have I paid to a lot up. of money for this ticket. Sit right. down. So I you know. have to stand up and you don't want to stand up. Right. And then, you know, the people behind you are pissed off. So everybody in, in succession seating is now pissed at it. Not only are you pissed, you're not closer, but now you're pissed. Your view is being blocked <laughs> by people. Maybe the rigger should come in and hoist the dancers up to the ceiling. Yeah, it is. It's interesting, though, how it all changed. And, and to yeah. kind of go back, we were talking about the rite of passage. That to, to me, and I've said this many times on this show, Mark, concerts to me, I used to have to go to review all the ones that came into town and they were, they, it, it got stale because of what we were just talking about. You know, I yeah. get my seat. They all looked the same. It didn't matter whether it was a country show or a heavy metal show. It was three minutes, say hello, Chattanooga, five songs, introduce the band. I mean, they were all the same and it kind of. And then when I started going to Bonnaroo, it was this whole awakening sort Different of thing. Vibe. It's like, it's like well, this is what I love about live music. And, and I was all in again. So yeah, that's what, and that's not what this book is about, but I'm just saying that it, um, no, the, the, but going forward, you make a great point, <clears throat> which is that the, the boot, let's call them boutique festivals become kinder, more intimate spaces where you're meeting people and you're seeing bands up close and people are dancing because it's a stand-up situation, arenas are a sit-down situation. And in some ways it's relative is, are these 
so-called psychedelic dungeons I was talking about, these old factories and old churches that leased space out to the, you know, these entrepreneurs who were having rock bands come in for five nights, you know, the, that you could, that there were no, there was no seating in those places, just like right. at the festivals, a lot of them where you were standing and you were dancing and you were talking to your friends, you're making friends with people next to you. And where do you live? And, Oh yeah. You know, I, I might know if somebody who went to that college, you know, it's a, it's just a much more conversational human experience. Of course, we just don't know how things are going to, end up when we come out of the pipeline on this COVID thing. But there was also the, sorry, Brad, there was also the fear, not the fear, the excitement. You didn't know what might happen yeah. at a rock show in, in those psychedelic dens. There, you know, there was always that chance. First of all, your parents, as you said earlier, your parents weren't there, right? you know, which made it exciting to begin with. And, and you were with strangers you didn't know what was going to happen, especially. The other like thing is, don't forget about the power of the solo. Today, we take solos for granted, right? So, you know, everybody's got a drum solo. Everybody's got a guitar solo. So solos today is like big deal, right? But, you know, Indigata DeVita would never have been a name anybody remembered if not for a little bit longer drum solo that happened in that album in like 1970 or 71. So the solo didn't exist back then because AM radio didn't allow a three minute 45 to have a solo. Solo. Most of the, you know, 90% of those 45s, there's no solo. But it's not until you get um, album rock and it's not until you get um, to FM radio and better bands where the solo becomes much more prevalent because they're real musicians. They're not wrecking crew studio musicians. They're real musicians who studied and trained. And it's it's a different scene. It's a different experience. So the excitement that you're talking about, that anticipation of a solo during a Santana concert at Madison Square Garden in the early 70s. Oh, my God, did you hear that? He played such an amazing solo. It wouldn't even be talked about today. So, right. but that's, that's, that's what was exciting back then, that a solo might be played. And today, what you're talking about is that excitement that who knows what might happen, who knows, you know, what they might play. Maybe suddenly somebody plays Sergeant, you know, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club, Hearts Club Band. Somebody will play a Beatles song or a, a punk band will play something that's completely unexpected or some, some, some heavy metal band will play a Carpenter's song, right? right something right. really weird. Or you know, a guest somebody, will show up. Yeah. Yeah. You exactly, wait for that. Exactly right. It's exciting. I mean, it, 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 I will say that the thing that I don't know, I hate to put it this way, but it is kind of depressing, you know, hearing you guys talk about especially album rock and the heyday of it and knowing that that's never coming back. You know, it's just it, there's just not a world where it is built for big, giant shows in big, large spaces. Frankly, there's only a dozen or two dozen artists that could pull that off to begin with right now. You know, the, the money doesn't work. It would be totally cost preventative for you and the family to go to that show or you and the wife to go to that show. You know, it just doesn't. And then you get it's, it's you, changed. You, you go to a Paul McCartney concert today and you look around, and you realize there are kids there who are brought there by their grandparents. Now, that's not a bad thing today because grandparents and their kids get along great. But it's it's not the same. But it's not really the music's fault or the arena's fault. Um, there's been a shift. And te you used to go to rock concerts, as I said, because it was a rite of passage. You transitioned from one phase in life to another or at the start. You came out and began the, the, the transition to a different, a different level. Um, today, kids find their rite of passage on their phones. On TikTok. They don't need to go to a rock concert and sit in the yeah. dark and listen to loud music and raise lighters in the air. I mean, now they, if, if they're having a hard time in school from a teacher, they're getting bullied or something's happening in their life. They're on their phone in right. real time, texting their friends yeah. or they're on their computer or they're on, you know, they're, they're FaceTiming or it's, you know, any number of platforms that are, that are in their hand that they, they don't need the rock. The rock concert is something they go each year with grandma, you know, to see, <laughs> yeah. to see or, the who or, or, or if, whatever yeah, they're seeing where, where that was a communal experience in 1975, our communal experience now is, you know, sharing memes that everybody seems to quote exactly. when they walk down. That's the exactly yeah. it. Yeah. Man, yeah. Mark, Mark, what a, what a fascinating conversation. The book is rock concert. Uh, we'll post a link uh, at uh, the what underscore podcast on uh, all the socials. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and, and diving into this book. It's such a fascinating topic. And, and part two, uh, from 85 to 2020, uh, you know, 
You need you some, never know. If you need some DJs to to start booking some shows, <laughs> I'll uh, you know put up the house. Which, by the way, I have made a note, and I don't really take many notes, but I've written down today that uh, my new synonym to check into hotels will be Frank Barcelona. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be Frank Barcelona from now on. It's like it's like it's like a, a global businessman name, you know. It's like <laughs> Joe Paris or you know Tony London. <laughs> Thanks, Barcelona. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Man All of right. intrigue, man of rock concerts and intrigue. <laughs> man uh, of rock but, concerts. Thank yeah. you so much, Mark. I Barry really appreciate Brad, it. Russ, thank you very much. It was a joy bouncing it around with you. It was really a lot of fun. Yeah, I think fun, the kids would call appreciate it. I think the kids would call it chopping it up. <laughs> they would. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> would. Okay. Thanks so okay, much. Guys. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Good. good thanks. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, good chat with Mark Myers. The book is Rock Concert. Uh, talked to all these DJs. N- never checked in with me. Never gave a uh, old Brad guy a call. <laughs> How old were you in '85? You don't, you Barry. You, do you really want to know? That's what I thought. You, do you really want to know? I, know? I mean, I'm not a young man um, hitting my 40th birthday, but I was four. I was four in 1985. Yeah. So your memories of uh, Live Aid probably didn't make the book. You know what? <laughs> Brad Kidd had some deep thoughts about Live Aid that he had loved to share. So this weekend, I'm going to a weekend two of ACL Fest. Um, I was not planning on going, but the last second, things just sort of worked out. Uh, Barry Quarter, very excited to share with you that um, I will be uh, seeing Duran Jones in the indications on a pre-show. I'll be seeing Duran Jones on Friday. Then I'll be seeing Aaron Fra- <laughs> Frazier on Saturday. I've got an entire weekend of Duran Jones the indications uh, set for myself. And then... On Friday, the big headliner is it Friday or Saturday? No, it's Friday. Big headliner on Friday, George Strait. Paco, do you want to ask him or should I ask him? Ask him what? Is he actually going to see a show or is this all? Oh, is this another oh. weekend of uh, dinner with Brad? Well, <laughs> well, Saturday, we're, it's a very special sushi comes. dinner that we have. Oh, no, no, um, no, don't do the sushi dinner. The, don't do uh, it. Can we? Is there a poster? Is there a dinner with Brad ACL poster? <laughs> I mean, I, you know what? I'm going to put up a lineup of just the menu items that I ordered. I'm going to uh, <laughs> put up a festival poster, just my dinner place. I want to see it. I want to see it in some sort of psychedelic. <laughs> I will Brad's say look, ACL trip. When, when we, when this lineup first came out, we were very excited about it. But once I uh, started diving in, not that excited. I, uh, yeah, I love Duran on it pretty quick. You know, I didn't get to do my picks for um, Bonnaroo, so I'll go through really quickly the things that I want to see at uh, ACL Fest. Duran Jones at uh, 3.30 on Friday is um, uh, uh, then I got, well, hang on. I got uh, I got Duran Jones on Friday. Then I've got uh, Erica Badu and Black Pumas later that night. And then George Strait at the same time as Miley Cyrus. I will be choosing George Strait on Friday on Saturday. Very excited. I'll be seeing Aaron Frazier and then I will be going to dinner. Um, And then on Sunday, I uh, will be watching the Washington football game and then going to see Cautious Clay and then coming home. So uh, that's my big (laughs) ACL weekend. Uh, I can't wait to share what I see and experience with you guys next week. We're going to have to have an over under taco. What a lineup. Yeah. (laughs) How many many of these he actually makes. (laughs) <laughs> what do you mean? How many I actually made? I only listed four artists that I was going to go see. I, think I know I four. I know, and I'm the over under is probably two. But how did I become the guy that is made fun of for not going to shows? I go to every show at Bonnaroo. <laughs> at Bonnaroo, <laughs> yeah, because there's no dinner options. <laughs> yeah, because you can't do anything else. You can't do anything because you know why? Because you're there. There it is. You're <laughs> yeah. there. You go. Right. You yeah. might as well go. Hopefully uh, next week we'll have ACL uh, wrap up. Lord Taco, Barry Quarter, uh, thank you for your show. We'll talk to you next week on the What Podcast. Love you.
Consequence Podcast Network.